The Gator Tales podcast with Sean Kelly is presented by UF Health. UF Health has locations throughout Florida, including Gainesville, Jacksonville, St. Augustine, Leesburg, and the Villages, and we're growing. Compassionate care and world-class outcomes, that's our game plan. Visit ufhealth.org to learn more. Our podcast is also brought to you by Pet Paradise. Gators fans, for pet fanatics like you, there's only one place who goes all out for your pet the way you do. Boarding, grooming, day camp, and veterinary services, all in one convenient location. Pet Paradise and New Day Veterinary Care. Finally, complete pet health care is here for Gator Nation. Hi again, Gators fans. Welcome into episode number 15 of Gator Tales with Sean Kelly. I'm Sean Kelly, and I hope this finds you well. They're scrambling all over campus right now. Final exams are right around the corner for most of our students, and we're winding down this fall semester both academically and athletically, too. For me right now, just grooving along with the Florida men's basketball team and a couple of other assignments here and there. Like this past weekend, I broadcast the Big 12 championship game for ESPN Radio. And lo and behold, my partner was a Gator too. I got to work with Max Starks, a Gator legend, an NFL star, and a Super Bowl champ too. He was my analyst for the Big 12 championship broadcast on ESPN Radio. And I took the opportunity to visit with him for our podcast. So he, of course, is going to be on episode number 15. And I know it doesn't feel like softball season, but it's right around the corner. This week, we turn our attention to softball. And Tim Walton will join us to wrap up the fall schedule and help us look forward to the new season that begins in February. Oh, and I mentioned that final exams are upon us here at UF. Our own Kenna McGinnis is back on campus for this episode. She takes a look at one of the more popular and historic study spots at our students' disposal. And one more thing academically. Our graduation rates are at an all-time high here for Gators Athletics. Congratulations to all of our student athletes who are finishing their semester or perhaps even their college academic careers. With that, let's get started. I take you to Arlington, Texas, where Mariano's, by the way, is a very good choice for Mexican food. I dined there with Max Starks and our entire crew. And then the next day, Max and I visited in the broadcast booth at AT AT&T Stadium. Okay, on the surface, it's going to start to appear that I will only broadcast games with Gators as I work with Shane Matthews and Tate Casey on Gators football broadcasts, Lee Humphrey on basketball, Jeff Cardozo with baseball uh, and now Max Starks. Yes, that Max Starks. Gator great, Super Bowl champion and uh, and now my partner on the Big 12 championship game. We finally got to do a game together, Max. No, this this is a long time coming, Sean. I'm so excited. You know, obviously when you got hired, I was ecstatic to know that you were going to be the voice of our Florida Gators and I can't be more happier to be on the on the cast today. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, when we met, I was not a Gator yet. You were obviously. So now this this makes total sense so that you and I will be paired together on these national broadcasts. This is not the only broadcasting you do. I want Gators fans to know that you are a regular on the air, not just with ESPN Radio, but what is it, Sirius XM, correct, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, so I, I'm the sideline reporter for the Pittsburgh Steelers on their game day broadcast. Also work for State, Steelers Nation Radio. I do a five-day-a-week show on there with Craig Wolfley, who's our in-the-booth analyst. And I work for Sirius XM. I work on NFL, college stations, especially the SEC Today show, primarily on Fridays. And, yeah, various other stations up and down the dial. And then I work locally in Arizona for 98.7 FM. So, yeah, so let's just say I'm very busy on the airwaves. No doubt, no doubt. How often do you get back to the state of Florida? You know, I get back about three times a year. You know, I have my annual football camp that I do at at my hometown in Orlando at Lake Highland Prep, and I've been doing that for the last 17 years. And, you know, I do also do various other activations. Ford has been one of my really good partners. We do a summer reading rally where we hit five counties in 30 days in the summer right there in central Florida. And uh, we provide free book supplies and summer reading supplies and you know, a couple of fun little goodies for the kids that come out and just try and make sure that the presence is felt, that we're giving the attention to the youth. You know, my, my cause is childhood literacy and education, so I try and make sure I have a presence there. Plus, my mom and my brother still live there, so it's always good to go and get a home-cooked meal every once in a while. Without a doubt. Will you help me understand, and there are a lot of Gators who are from the state of Florida who won't go on to play in Gainesville. You the same. 
What made it so special for you, Max? Well, I think one of the biggest things, and, you know, I, I, had, I had an opportunity to go to a lot of different places, but I actually took an unofficial visit to Florida, and it was an amazing place to know that you're not only getting top-tier academics, but you're also playing on one of the largest stages, being in the, in the Southeastern Conference, the greatest conference in all of football and all sports. Um, but it was a proximity to home. It was good to be near home and an hour and a half away. You could drive up, drive down and be back home and that's one of the things i really enjoyed you know being close to family being close to friends and also being at a top tier institution and i felt like that was a big sticking and selling point for guys who are in state the fact that you can still be that close to home and still get a top rate education as well as well as competing athletically week in and week out against some of the best te teams in the country when you look back on your playing career at florida or your time there as a student what became a part of your DNA then that is still in existence today? You know, I, I, th I think the relationships, um, <clears throat> you know, the networking that, that I was able to do while I was there, the friends that I made were lasting friendships. And I think, you know, when you look at any time that you spend at a place, you want to leave a mark. And, you know, having the opportunity to do a lot of things, not only on the football field, but off. Um, charitable work. You know, I worked with the Gator Literacy Program. I was on the SAC committee while I was there. And just developing that love for service, you know, and that, that need to serve and fulfill, to give to those, you know, in need and find your place. And I felt like, you know, that really provided the groundwork for kind of what I do today. You know, I think about it, my charitable program has been around in Orlando for almost two decades now. And it's something that I have a love and a passion for. And I started, like I said, Gator Literacy Program was where I got my start volunteering around, around Alachua County and in the greater Gainesville area. And, you know, from there, the friendships that I made, like my best friend, funny enough, from high school was my valedictorian in high school and also my valedictorian at University of Florida. Really? Yes, it, it was the craziest thing. So Anup Patel, my, one of my good buddies, now a doctor in Orlando, uh, he, you know, he and I have just <laughs> been together the whole way. So those type of relationships, you know, I still talk to a lot of my former teammates. We still have a great time. I go on Ben Troop's show all the time. Uh, when, when he calls, we have great repartee back and forth. And, you know, you look at just those different times and moments and I'm a member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. I was on the presidential search committee when I was there. I served in student government. So all of those friendships, uh, you know, still pay dividends today, and we still get together. We still have a good time, and we always celebrate the orange and blue. Yeah. As I mentioned, you know, I, I obviously work with Shane and Tate on a regular basis. Those two guys represent different eras in Gators football. Those two have been now near the forefront of trying to reconnect Gators alumni, football alumni, with the present day program you yourself represent an, an era in itself are, are you engaged in those efforts would you like to see those efforts move forward I would love to see those move forward I mean I've had the opportunity to come back at num numerous times obviously my schedule doesn't work <laughs> since I work during the season um, it would be nice to be for me to find a way to get back more I would love to see that but I hear the engagement you know my good buddy Shannon Snell um, and seeing what he does with the program in and around especially with the offensive line group specifically you know ma makes me it makes me happy to see that there is a connection from the past um, to the present. And then, you know, I think I think having the coaches that you do on staff, you know, one of one of my good friends and teammates, Darnell Stapleton, sits on that staff, my buddy Mike Peterson, you know, Cheston Blackshear. So, you know, I've had the opportunity to come back to school. I actually went last year when uh, when we were playing in Jacksonville. Uh, drove down afterwards, went and spoke to the team, saw that brand new beautiful facility that used to be a baseball field that's no longer a baseball field that overlooks the track. I mean, it's a, it's a world-class facility, and to know that the intention and the desire to provide a world-class facility there at this school um, for all the student athletes was something that I felt was really cool. So I look forward to more opportunities to re-engage with guys because I think it, it is that important because those are the greatest years and those are formative years of a young man's life or a young athlete's life. And you want you want to go back to that. The nostalgia that's there, you know, the fandom and just everything that it encompasses, you want to be a part of that. When you do your speaking engagements, what's your favorite Steve Spurrier slash Ron Zook story to tell? Oh, man. So, so for Spurrier, the easiest one was, I'll never forget this, it was my first start. Or I should say, the first time I got to get into a game, it was against Ball State, and we were backed up on our own one-yard line. And Coach Spurrier and Jimmy Ray Stevens was our O-line coach, and he's like, all right, Max and Shannon, y'all are in. And we're like, are they backed up on the one? 
It's our first. Okay. So we go out there. I'll never forget this. We had we had, we had a draw play, and we're on we're on the left side or on the back side. And I signal to Shannon, "Hey, fan, fan, fan." Shannon's not looking at me. Shannon's just like shaking his head, not moving. I'm like, "Fan." So I set out. There's two guys on me. I try to do the double spread eagle, put my hands out wide. I'm like, "I'm, I'm gonna hit both these guys, right?" You know, the 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 naivety of me to think that I could hit two veteran defensive linemen in college as a freshman first play ever i got out there i hit nothing hit nothing and rob g robert gillespie our running back gets hit in the backfield for a safety we come to the sideline jimmy ray is just cussing us out spurrier is upset he's rubbing his forehead vigorously he won't throw he won't throw the hat I, he probably threw the hat on the sidelines when the play was happening yeah. but he didn't throw it while we were there and so we get to meetings the next day and you can just feel it. So the way the meeting room was, kind of this escalating thing, we kind of sat in the back as freshmen. And I just remember sliding my seat down. I slide my seat. I'm like, here's the play. It's about to come. I know he's going to say something. I don't want him to see me. And he and he stops the tape. He looks at. He looks back where he because he knows where everybody is. Like Spurrier has a steel trap mind. And so he turns the lights on. He's like Maxi. He's like son. You're big enough to block two some guns. You can't even block one here. Watch this. And, and everybody just erupts. Shannon's sitting next to me. He's laughing. And he's like, oh, no, 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 Shannon. You can just tone that down there because you were supposed to be out there. You left your buddy out to dry. <laughs> so, so that was, I was like, oh, my God. And then still to this day, I'll never forget this. We're going, we're going, we come back for the, uh, the Ring of Honor ceremony. And Coach Burrier's going in. I was at the gala the night before. We're at the tailgate. Coach Spurrier is holding court uh, over in the tailgate. He comes over. I'm like, man, well, I know, I know where I can get some jack. <laughs> I'm legal now. I'm not, I'm not 18 anymore. And Coach Spurrier says, Maxie, you remember that play where you were too, big enough to block two guys and you couldn't block one? I was like, oh, my God. And he says, here, drink on up, son. And I was like, oh, my God. But that's Coach Spurrier for you, you know? Um, I had another one. It was a recruiting story. He came to Lake Holland Prep, my school in Orlando. And uh, it was him and Coach Collins, Jimmy Collins, who was our linebackers coach. They come to my basketball practice because it's in the winter, and they're sitting up in the top of top of this little little uh, uh, school gym. Oh, yeah. Only two guys in there. Now, mind you, all my classmates are looking at me like, "Oh my God, this Coach Spurrier!" Like, blah 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 blah. And so they're 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 giving me a hard time the whole time in practice. And so they, they they get up and and so my 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 basketball coach at the time decides, you know what, <clears throat> I'm gonna make sure that that Max. Uh, Max has all the attention in the world. So I had to shoot free throws for our suicides. So for every missed free throw, I had I had to run a suicide, which is every line in our court. And we played multiple sports in there. So I'm nervous. I have I have five free throws to shoot. I go four for five. So we only have to run one suicide. So I look good in the moment. So afterwards, I go downstairs to meet with Coach Collins and Coach Spurrier. They're in my athletic director's office, kind of like because it kind of sits elevated. So we kind of go down below. And Coach Spurrier just, he's sitting in our AD's desk. And I come in, I'm sweating. I'm sitting in my basketball uniform. He just has one phrase where he says, he's like, Max, I just want to let you know, your future's in a three-point stance, not behind three-point line, come to Florida. That was it. That was, <laughs> that was it. it. That, was it. <laughs> that was the end The end of the visit. Uh, yep. The rest is history, isn't the it? The rest is history. Well, uh, you know, we're here inside AT&T Stadium. We're going to finish this interview while they rehearse the national anthem. So this will be a first for Gator Tales as well. Yes. It'll be great to work with you today. And uh, and just know we're looking forward to your next time back in Gainesville, Max. I can't wait, Sean. And, and they couldn't have picked a better guy to be the voice of the Gators. So I love listening, man, and continue to hold the Gator standard up there. And I can't wait to get back to Gville. Thank you. Go Gators. Go Gators. Hi again, everyone. It's Kenna McGinnis. It's that time in the semester that students like me are scrambling for a great spot in a library. So for this week's Kenna on Campus, I wanted to bring you all to the library at the University of Florida. If you go through the Plaza of the Americas towards the northeast end of campus, you'll find yourself walking upon Smathers Library, which inside has always reminded me of Hogwarts from the Harry Potter movies. Decades worth of collections of Gators history is stored inside of Smathers. But to learn more about it, I had to find the right person. So my name is Sarah Coates, and I am the University Archivist here for the George A. Smathers Libraries at the University of Florida. I'm pretty sure I know what that means. 
My whole job here is to save and share the story and history of the University of Florida. By the end of my visit, I learned about what boys, beanies, and a biscuit have in common. But anyway, back to Sarah. I actually uh, collect records from all of the administrative units on campus and the various colleges and departments. So I have things here from the president's papers, from the presidents that have been here at the university, down to, you know, college and department level, faculty minutes, uh, meeting minutes, agendas. I also have newsletters and reports and things from these various departments. Um, in addition to the more administrative records, we also try to document student life. So we have the student newspaper, the alligator, we have that um, freely available online. Um, but we also have photographs and memorabilia and other student newspapers that were produced here at UF that we use um, whenever we talk about the university and share its story and history with students. Okay, and you just listed so many amazing things about this university that we have to share with our students and our staff and anybody else interested do you have a personal favorite or you know I know the freshmen used to wear caps back in the day and you said something about a biscuit earlier why don't you share a little bit of that with me all right so I'll save the biscuit for last because that's the best bit okay. but um so yes in the early days of the campus the, the freshmen wore what were called rat caps they looked like a little beanie that kind of sat back on the back of your head um they were required to wear these outside at all times it basically identified them as a freshman so that if they looked lost, people could help them. Um, but it also served as a, you know, this is a reminder of the fact that you are now a UF college student. Um, the little rat caps were usually orange and they had usually a blue or orange little bill on them. Um, and they had the, the UF F in the center and then on either side of the F they would have that student's graduating year. Um, these were popular clear up through the early 50s, late 50s, um, before the trend started to die out um, and now they're no longer worn. Um, we do have some rat caps here on, on campus in the university archives. Um, we don't have as many as we probably could because generally at the end of the year the freshmen would have a big bonfire and chuck their rat caps <laughs> into the fire at the end of the year. Um, because they were tired of wearing them yeah, um, yeah and they're made out of wool so you can imagine wearing a little wool hat on your head you know in Florida in, in the Florida heat it's it's not fun but so yes so that is one popular um, popular item that I have here in University Archives but my absolute personal favorite I love this I love this so much that we have it I can't believe we still have it is what is called the biscuit and it has garnered me the nickname of biscuit lady across campus um, when I when I show this to classes I always tell students if you can't remember who I am and you need to ask me a question, just ask your professor who is the biscuit lady and they'll they'll know who I am. They'll okay. give you my, my email. Um, and it has stuck. I have had students call me that. Um, but anyway, here in University Archives, we have a biscuit. Yes, it is a real biscuit. I'm not, not joking. Nope, oh, it is wow, not okay. moldy. It is perfectly preserved, but it looks like a little hard tack from the Civil War. So let me tell you the story of the biscuit. So back in 1913, UF was an all-male school. We were all-male from 1905 to 1947. Um, and there was a young man who was a student here, and he was writing to a lady friend up at Shorter College in Georgia. And he was complaining about how bad the food was in the cafeteria. Perennial problem, right? I mean, campus food is, is always bad. And she was like, yeah, 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 sure. I, I believe you, whatever. And he goes, fine, I'll prove it. So he took a biscuit from the cafeteria and he flipped it over and he wrote on the bottom of it, Souvenir University of Florida Mess Hall, 1913. Flips it back over and on the top of it, he writes her name, her address up there at Shorter College in Georgia. And then he puts a stamp on it and puts it in the mail. No okay, packet, no, yeah. no, no, envelope, no package, no envelope, no nothing. Stamp, address, biscuit. biscuit. That was it. Okay. It arrives to her home up there at Shorter College in Georgia. She writes back, ha ha ha, very funny, I got your biscuit. Yeah, you're right, it is really terrible. She hung on to it, I, I don't know why. She hung on to it. Right. And they meet up again in the 1940s in Tallahassee. She brings the biscuit with her and gives it back to him, ha ha, do you remember this? And he's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you kept this. So then he kept it until sometime in the 60s or 70s when he was cleaning out his house and he realized, oh, hey, I still have this. And he actually then wrote a letter to the university president with the story of the biscuit, as I just told it to you. And by the way, enclosed is the biscuit. And he actually put the biscuit with the letter, to which the president's office promptly turns around and says, here, library, do something with this. 
<laughs> so we now have the biscuit. Um, it is 110 years old um, here in University Archives, and we have actually made digital images. So we took pictures of the biscuit, and you can view them online. Um, the web address is go.ufl.edu slash biscuit. And if you go there, you can see the biscuit. We have digital images of the front and the bottom, uh, top and bottom of the biscuit, um, including the stamp that is still on it. Um, for a long time, we thought that there was no way this thing went through the mail, you know, with no packaging on it, because you couldn't really course, see yeah. cancellation marks on the stamp. Right. Um, but if you look really, really closely on the actual biscuit itself, right about where Washington's nose and chin are on the stamp. If you look straight over from that, you can just barely see the cancellation lines on the stamp, on the biscuit from the stamp. Yeah. That's my favorite thing. <laughs> so like there's no nibbles on the biscuit or anything from her having tried it? No, she didn't try it. I don't think she was brave enough to try it. <laughs> so going through with no package at right. All. But it is, I mean, it is a very small disc and it's not very thick. Like all of the moisture is, is gone from this okay, thing yeah. and has been gone for a very long time. But we do have it in a special little box. Um, if anyone would love to come see the biscuit in person, you can always reach out to us and we're happy to pull it out to let you see it in person as well as online. I'll leave it up to you, Gator fans, to see the biscuit yourself. The good news is, at least, our food is much better now. From Smathers Library, I'm Kenna McGinnis. Gator Tales continues with softball coach Tim Walton. We kind of get him at a good time. I think it's December, so it's in between fall and the spring schedule. Tim, is this the best time to talk to you? Is it slowed down a little bit this time of year for you? Yeah, once we get uh, you know down the home stretch with finals and um, you know the the end of the fall meetings and kind of go over where we were at and where we're going and where we need to get to. Uh, it's definitely a good time, good reflection time, a little bit more downtime, less less scripted events, and and a little bit more, uh, you know, just uh, food for the soul type of days. How's your cornhole game? Zero. I wish I could play. I yeah, I've been playing more ping pong uh, lately than than cornhole, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll get you into the neighborhood game here coming up. I, you know, I think this is also a good time for me to catch up with you because I know a little bit about what's coming in the spring with you guys and I don't know a whole lot of stuff. Maybe that's the case for you too as the head coach of the Gators with a lot of new pieces getting ready for the spring. It, it's funny because when you when you say it that way I think I'm the exact same way. It's like we're really really young but we're really really old in so many different ways and so uh, the fall was very uh, adventurous. There was a lot of learning and um, you know it's funny when you've got old players they want to hurry up and get teach all the new players all the tricks and all the tricks of the trade and all the stuff and it's like hey it's a process and the biggest thing that that came out of like our first week of team practice was oh man we just we got to get better we got uh we got to get we got to communicate better we got to do things a little bit differently and it's like we will it'll take time don't worry and we through the entire fall about once a week we got together as a group on the field and went over different things and then when you put them all on the same field you know the, the the beginning of October it's like oh my gosh we're not great at this we're not great at that we need to get better at it but it just takes time and I think that's one thing that by the end of the fall um, we were a lot more oil we've got some new um, rules in our game and some technology pieces and some one-way communication that baseball's had for years and a shot I call it a shot clock but we got the pitch clock and uh, things like that so there's a lot of learning that still has to take place and I think the fall was is, was a good place to do that okay you brought the rule changes is it good for the game are these the rule changes that we collectively as softball fans are ready for and think are necessary you know, it's one thing, um, I, I think that obviously there's always the intended and the unintended consequences of rules and gamesmanships and all the other stuff, but I think the intention of the rules is really good. I think it's in place to help speed the game up and to take some of the nuances, um, you know, stepping out of the batter's box, doing a you know, complete 360 out of the pitching circle and go out. It's like, it, it's definitely going to help. Um, people's patience level, probably on the field more than off the field. Um, I like it. I definitely enjoy watching um, uh, us play against other teams when there's a, a pace of play um, to it. Some of the unintended things, you know, there's it just there's a lot of um, you know there's just a lot of stuff that has to take place, and so you're just trying to teach your young people how to you know, kind of deal with some of the adversities of you know what they need to do and, and what and what time frame they need to get it done in. 
I'm just being honest because I'm more of the casual observer. Enjoy the sport very much. I'm not immersed in the day to day. It just seemed like a short time ago, man, softball was great. We're playing like an hour and whatever it changed, the game really moves. And then I remember watching last year and I was like, boy, this seems to be in the mud here a little bit. We need a pitch clock because I'm thinking about the other side of the road there, the baseball side and how that changed things. What happened? Or was it always that way? You know, was the pitch clock something that we've recently needed in the game or... Help me understand that. What was the evolution? Well, I think, you know, in in Major League Baseball, if you threw 88 to 92 miles an hour 20 years ago, you're a Hall of Famer. And now 88 to 92, you know, you're 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 playing independent ball because you're don't throw hard enough and you don't have a, a tremendous, you know, out pitch. Um, I think the game of softball was so new that it just it finally the hitters finally caught up to some of the pitching and you know now we've got pitchers out there throwing 73 miles an hour and they're getting turned around like it's nothing and the old days that's a one nothing game with 18 strikeouts oh, okay. and I think that it, overall it's it's the the amount of the amount of time that's being put into e, e, the amount of time that each hitter puts into themselves. Um, hitting is just you know caught up to uh, a lot of pitching and um, there's still some really really talented pitchers out there but they're getting fouled off they're foul ball down the right field line you know we we just have things that the game wasn't ready for and it's just taking time for us to just put some pieces back together Um, but again at the end of the day too there's you know we can play a pretty quick game and then you you the most important games of the year have a two to two and a half minute break between each inning because you've got uh, television and the sponsors and stuff that's necessary for growth Um, so I think that a lot of that there but there's a lot more foul balls there's a lot more walks there's a lot more hits than there ever was and I think the stuck in the mud is that the 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 defenses are better the hitting's better the pitching um, is is good but it's not as dominant it was one now we're playing it 43 feet to now as opposed to 40 feet and that really changed the you know the opportunities for hitters to make sound adjustments um, and be able to actually see the ball before they start swinging so I think there's some some definite uh, growth there I'm glad I asked see I'm glad I asked let's get back to the some of the stuff that I do know you have an all-american first team shortstop and Skylar Wallace who will be back I know what she's like as a player I'm curious how do you coach a player that that's that is that good and that skilled uh, at this level. I think she would agree that she's one of the toughest individuals to coach because she has a, a roadmap to what the day is going to look like and the day better look like that. And so um, I'm talking about high level of work, high level of intent. Um, she likes to have fun. She likes to communicate. But when she works, she works. She gets laser focused. She wants to be really good at everything. And it could be throws. It could be um, her fielding. It could be turning double plays. It could be pop flies. I mean, she's got a she's got a list. And then I didn't even talk about the hitting. And I mean, that takes right. as much time as anything. But she is. It's almost like a father, like seeing her growth and development um, as a person, as a player, as a leader, as a competitor. Um, she's not 360 because she's an amazing athlete, but she's a, at least 180 degree turn from the time she stepped on this campus to where she's at now in all those phases. And I think that's something I'm the most proud of. Uh, like, again, as her coach, uh, she's a tremendous athlete to watch. And um, I feel like at times I'm playing a video game with her. I'm like, hey, why don't you do this? And she's like, really? OK, let's see. Boom. Scoreboard or, you know, something. She hit a ball the other day. 268 feet at 80.4 miles an hour exit. Nobody, very few people hit the ball 80 miles an hour off the bat in softball. And, um, and the ball was, I mean, it was, it was as big of a ball as I've seen hit. And um, she goes, all right, I think I'm done for the day. You know, it's one of those. So, you know, it's, she's, she's amazing. She's, she's very talented to be, nobody understand. I don't think I've ever coached a first team all American shortstop to be the first team all American shortstop is the hardest thing to get in the sport because at large first team or that shortstop is the hardest. It's typically the best athlete. It's the best player on the field. And, uh, I think she proved that uh, that's exactly what she is. Tim, did you figure out how to coach her on your own, or did you talk to others who have coached elite athletes in their past? I I, I talked to her. Um, I think she's taught me a lot about myself. I think she's taught me a lot about her. And um, I, I honestly have, have felt like it's just been our relationship that's allowed um, me to coach her and her to coach me. She, she said to me you know, that she trusts me, and she said, whatever you tell me to do, 
um, I'll do it. And um, I've learned that it can't be just words. It has to be, it can't be a hunch. It's got to be provable. I got to show her. I got to show her what she looks like. I got to show her what she looked like. And, um, and I think that's been the, the thing that's been the best is it's not just I wake up one day and say, hey, we're going to do this. It's I've really thought about this. Let me show you this. And if the timing is right, and I think that's the advice I can give you know, all coaches, if, if the timing is right, helping someone get better, especially when they're that high of a level of competitor, if the timing is right, I see tremendous growth in her professionally and personally. Um, if the timing's wrong, if I do it from home plate and I yell at her, hey, you got to do this, this um, there's going to be a potential fight because she's so competitive and she believes that she's doing it one way and I'm believing it's doing it another way. Very few times do I coach her like I would have coached her 20 years ago because she doesn't respond to that 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 way. It has to be a little bit more private. It has to be a little bit more personal and it has to be a little bit more provable and and, and she'll do it. You mentioned her leadership skills. Who else will help her lead the 2014? Well, we have we have quite a few players on this team that I think are really good leaders. Um, they all do it differently. Uh, Emily Wilkie is probably one of the more vocal leaders of this team. Uh, she does a really she's so positive and she works really hard and she you know she's the glue between the catchers and the pitchers. Uh, we brought in Jocelyn Erickson and Jocelyn Erickson is a as kind of a silent assassin. Um, as good a player as I think that um, we've we've we ever had in this program. She's going to be phenomenal. Um, she's a lot. She's different than Skyler, but the, the, where they are similar, they both have high-level work ethic. They're both super athletic, and they both hit the ball really, really hard, and I think that makes it fun to watch. Um, and then I think that we have some younger players. You know, a- Ava Brown is a freshman, but she's done a really good job of being able to um, – just uh, she has a she has a, a competitiveness about her. She has a grit about her that I really like, and she's done a really good job. But I, uh, Corby Otis is another one. She's an older player that's come in, and the final two are Avery Gels and and and, and uh, Kendra Falby. She did such a great job in the outfield, leading drills every day, setting the tone, just being a really good example for not only the returning players that know her, but also the new players that are trying to figure out how we do it at Florida. Coin the phrase, we go hard all the time, and none goes harder than Kendra every single day. We have a lot of players that really have professional, they've, they've really professionally developed, and they've learned how to communicate with their teammates, they've learned how to communicate with themselves, and then the final piece is they, they understand how to communicate to their coaches what they need, because that's the secret to success. The coaches have a plan, but if you're not hitting a player's needs, I don't know how you're going to get the most out of them. So we really lean on our players to, to give us a good idea of what do you need every day to be successful. And then, especially on game days, game days are for the players. They're not for the coaches. They're, they're, they're all about the players. And I just want to help my players get to not only get to what their goals are, but help them reach that in a way that they think is, um, you know, it's not acceptable, but that they really buy into. And I think that's one of the biggest um, secrets to success is just getting your players to be invested in themselves. They do the right way you got a championship level team offensively tim it seemed like you guys had by the metrics or the numbers a very good offensive team a a season ago is this team similar in any way to what you had last spring offensively yeah we're better um with the exception of you know losing you know charlotte eccles is a huge loss to us just because of what she did at third base and right now it's the biggest hole that we have on the field just replacing an all-american third baseman and you know that bat that batted in that middle of the lineup forever but um i I do i think with kendra's better skyler's better skyler had an average fall in her mind and she still was 638 in everything uh, uh outside opponents 638 with almost a 700 on base percentage and um, it's just funny to see, but we're, we're better, a tick better at every position. Um, Kendra was a little bit better. Katie Kisser was a little bit better. Avi Gels was a little bit better. Reagan Walsh was a little bit better. Emily Wilkie was a little bit better. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, and I, I think with the addition of a really good freshman class, very athletic, very talented, um, and then the couple of the transfers that came in there, I think this offense is actually better. And it's not easy to do what we did last year either. You know, down by five in the first inning, you're like, oh my gosh, we're down by five. And the next you know, it's six to five in the second. You know, they were able to compartmentalize the pitching defense to being on the you know, offensive side. And I think that was one of the, it's the hardest thing to really to put into words who's your best hitter on your team our best pitcher because the pitchers make you feel like you're going to win every single game and so therefore you swing with a little different confidence you swing with a little different edge and so what they did last year was is very good metrically but it's even harder to tell you what they did psychologically they overcame some obstacles that are really difficult to overcome so it was like anti 
softball human nature. Is that what you're saying? Anti is probably an understatement. Yeah. You know, you're thinking, hey, we got to get two runs today and we'll win the game. And, you know, last year I was like, hey, we got to get eight. We started off the season. I was like, we set the goal at six, six runs a game. And by the time the season was over, we're like, hey, we got to get eight. Like it just, it just changed. And it, you know, it is what it is. And and we're playing some really good teams with a really good schedule. And, you know, there's some fist fights that were going on. And, you know, the battle we have with Kentucky in four straight games, I mean, between two pitching staffs that, you know, were giving up at least three runs a game and the offense that was hitting home runs and finding ways to score i mean it was a fist fight and you know we obviously beat them at the sec tournament but we're very evenly matched with a lot of teams across the board we're going to delve more into the remember i said earlier i don't know a lot of things that seems to be the case in most everything i do so let's delve more into that i don't know anything about your pitching coming up i do know you mentioned freshmen and there are two of them with credentials as long as my arm but I don't know what you have pitching wise. Do you? Yeah, we we you know we had a, a very adventurous fall. So with uh, the two you mentioned, Keegan Rothrock and Ava Brown, um, those two are uh, Gatorade National Player of the Year um, members. Which is it's difficult to do your own state, let alone be the national. And both of them have those honors in their you know in their on their wall, and they are they are as advertised. Um, I think uh, Ava Brown is uh, a two-way player. She's a hitter who's a tremendously competitive pitcher. She's not going to be your, um, she's not going to be a sub one ERA pitcher. She's going to have games where she's going to shut you out, yeah. but she's not. She's not a huge swing and miss person. She's more competitive than she is probably you know metrics. Um, you know, getting high spin rate stuff. She's very competitive. You know, she won the the Texas State Championship in high school two years in a row. Won the Gatorade Player of the Year two years in a row, and then was the National Player of the year um, she had a banged up after her high school season she was banged up she didn't get to pitch almost the whole entire summer um, then Keegan Rothrock and and she had a great career um, in Indiana at Ron Colley High School and her story was the same she had some injuries and nothing that was in and, and so really those two are our featured one and two Olivia uh, Miller is a freshman as well Orlando from here in Orlando from Bishop Moore High School um, left-handed um, so those those hard and she's getting better as every day goes on and then we we added uh, Mackenzie Wooten who's a grad transfer who's actually in physical therapy school which when you're in physical therapy school you're in physical therapy school and you get a chance to come out to play softball so we don't know how much we're going to get her are we going to get her on the road um, but the three pitchers that I mentioned with uh, with Keegan Keegan Rothrock's numbers um, she her metrics I mean there's spin rates and the velocities and the vertical and the horizontal break I mean she does it all um, she, she she's getting there you know she has to learn how to get through a you know a first team all-american shortstop a first team first team all-american you know a Jocelyn Erickson type but she's she's getting there she's got she's improved a lot they all have really improved a lot with with our new pitching coach Chelsea Dobbins and and the mentoring that she's done and being able to teach them how to work being able to teach them how to adjust being able to teach them that you're already really good now let's tweak some this this and this and and giving them some buy-in to their to their style and what they want to be and changing speeds and that's the biggest thing that you you really underestimate just how much speed differentials do you have between pitches because you know that's the key to getting good hitting off of its time is if you throw every pitch I don't care if it breaks or doesn't break if you throw every pitch at the same speed uh, eventually it's going to come in at a high speed and go out at a high speed and you got to learn how to change it and move it around and um, that's the one thing that I think all of our pitchers are learning how to do uh, locate your pitches move your pitches and then you got to change speeds if you don't change speeds it's going to be it's going to be a long or a short game for you okay two more things i wanted to talk to you about one of them was staff changes you mentioned chelsea dobbins who comes over from north carolina and she takes over your pitching staff what will she bring to the table what has she already started with yeah so she was the associate head coach at north carolina for a long time um, you know, she's a, a, a mentor. She's used to balancing and juggling a lot of things. She's helping us with our run game. We're trying to get a little bit better at our run game, even though we already steal bases and run and do some stuff. Just trying to get a little bit better, um, you know, an inch better every day if we can. Just trying to work on little things, nuances of, of, you know, just the hip angles and how we break down and the decisions that we can make off the batted ball. So she's helping that. But the main focus for her is pitching. I think that's when you, when you hire somebody to be your pitching coach, you need them to be immersed in. The, the, the daily lives of the pitcher because they spend more time in the pitching lab than they spend on the field and they have to work on their game, they work on their pitches, um, they're working on their style, they're working on, you know, sometimes they're, 
uh, they had a bad weekend or they're having bad, you know, they, they got a boyfriend back home. They didn't bring with them to Gainesville and they're having to just deal with things. And I think she's a good source of being able to help. So I think that that value to, to give them, um, you know, the mentorship and the leadership. And um, some days it's going to be her shoulder to cry on. Some days it's going to be, you know, hey, you better you better get better and you got to get tougher. And she's been able to do a little bit of both, I think, with these. She knows how young they are. And she's really handled them with um, with the care, but also teaching them along the way of what what's expected. And the other person is Francesca Nea, bringing back a three time All American um, softball player. I won't say outfielder because outfield is a position she played because she didn't start as an outfielder. Okay. She is a catcher, um, tore her ACL at first base right here on this field, and um, and tore her ACL again. And so she had she had a tough go at it, you know. With um, but to find a way to still be a three time All American and to play an outfield position you've never played before she's a great she's a great competitor a great softball player a great worker to that relationship piece that we talked about with Skylar she and I had as good of a relationship um, Amanda Lorenz comes to mind really quickly too mm-hmm. as far as we spent more time in the cages mastering her being you know, you know being the all-american um, scary hitter that she she became and she's done a great job too um, you know she's super competitive she work, has a high uh, work ethic she loves the Gators and she wants to help our young people just accomplish things and so I th- it's been really nice that the two female additions on our staff between me and Eric has been a really good balance to giving our players not only the competitive side of things but also having you know having a, a woman in their lives that's not their mom to just give them a little different perspective on life and the game and work and you know who you are and what you want to be and it's been really really good good balance for staff makes total sense last thing is this tim is softball is going back into the olympics hallelujah 28 if i'm not mistaken what does that mean for the sport what does it mean for you personally how much involvement will you have moving forward with that yeah for the sport it's it's uh it's everything i mean i look at you know 1996 was the first ever olympic games with softball in it in uh, in they actually played it in athens and they played it in columbus georgia but in in atlanta georgia and uh there was a lot of things that came about from that. The next year, the SEC started softball. Yeah. Um, all the venues that were built um, were built in and around uh, the uh, you know the Olympic um, events and. Um, so moving forward, it's everything. It gives kids not only um, now a reality to their dreams. 2028, I saw the uh, last weekend they had a big uh, kind of a, a quote unquote evaluation of young talent to got, kind of get them into the mix. And looks like hundreds of kids um, trying out to be, you know, future Olympians. And so I think that's huge for the game. Um, for me personally, you know, I've had an involvement since uh, 2015 with USA Softball, uh, won some world championships. Um, believe I'll go to the world championships next summer in Italy. Just got back from Pan Am Games. It, it's the cool thing is I'm not the head coach. So if I were the head coach, it would be really tough to be the Gator head coach and the and the head coach of the USA you know uh, national team. But I can tell you, being an assistant coach, my my role is great. I uh, it's been so fun, and it's almost rejuvenating. You know, playing and working with athletes that the goal is to win a gold. The goal isn't, you know, all the things that we have to do here and, you know, in in collegiate athletics. It's the the goal is to win a gold. And you go and you train, you work, you compete, and you do it. And um, that part's been fun. So the commitment hasn't been huge. um, But the talent that we get a chance to coach and the the opportunities to mentor and uh, um, reflect on that has been rejuvenating. And so I've enjoyed it. As long as they'll have me, I'll probably do it. As long as Florida, um, you know, allows me to do it I'll do it but um, right now it's unfortunately the timing of you know we, we haven't you know won an SEC championship since 2021 we haven't been to the World Series since 2022 but that has nothing to do with my enrollment or involvement with USA softball right. it's actually just the just the timing of things and the ebb and flow of talent and stuff like that and winning games being rejuvenated it's a good thing you're almost 20 years in now as the head coach of the Gators do you still feel certain things that you did 20 19 18 years ago this time of year heading toward a new season as you are feeling right now yeah i think you know people are people i think that's the one thing about you know you you hear all the stories of coaches that after they retire from their coaching job that they've done for such a long period of time they either go into a series of depression or they you know they've passed away because part of their you know their part of their lives is is over and so I do feel the same energy to, to, to go out and practice and to coach. I think the young people, um, and that's the good thing about college is you get a new crop of young people in every single year that just makes you feel younger. I mean, 
other than looking in the mirror, I feel pretty good. Um, I enjoy it. I love competing. Um, and, and it's funny, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a gator because, you know, I obviously I, I didn't graduate from Florida. And I think there's a lot of uh, pride that I, I, I try to share with our people that graduate from Florida. But I felt more like a gator this last year than I think I ever have in my entire coaching career because of my passion and love. I, I find myself on t- watching TV and listening to you call games. It's like, I become more of a, I'm cheering and I'm not like coaching. I'm just, you know, I be, I feel like I've just grown passionately in love with the Gators. And so I think that's, maybe it's my age. Maybe it's the fact that my kids are all moving out and doing their own thing. And my daughter's, a, you know, is a Gator. She's going to graduate next month or actually next week. And so I've just become a lot more, um, you know, I guess when you write your check to the, the University of Florida for an, uh, academics for your kid, I think you just become an, you know, a, a lifelong Gator. But I love the Gators. And I think that, that will never change uh, just the passion that I have for this institution and what we do for our young people. I love it. Coach, we're all Gators. We just got to be Gators in different ways. It's hard to believe that games begin again on February the 9th. Happy holidays. Enjoy the last breath before it all st- starts all over again. Thanks, Sean. Go Gators. And that's a wrap for episode number 15. And as always, thanks to our sponsors, UF Health and Pet Paradise, head coach Tim Walton, Max Starks, Kenna McGinnis, too. Classes may be coming to an end, but the schedule for athletics continues to roll through the rest of December. Men's and women's basketball will be super busy, finally leading up to some home games later in the month. National Signing Day for football is coming up, and the transfer portal is open, too. For another couple of weeks. Next time will be our last Gator Tales with Sean Kelly episode for the fall semester. We'll take a holiday break after that. Please help us spread the word about the Gator Tales with Sean Kelly podcast. Kindly leave a review wherever you are consuming. And of course, we'll welcome your feedback and suggestions for future guests. I'm Sean Kelly. So long for just a while and go Gators. <laughs>